classroom or the gym or on the field, um, there was a real problem. And so we wanted to do something about it and not just in sports, but across the education landscape. So together with our X Games brand, we launched Shred Hate. And Shred Hate brings in the no bully system to schools across the country. Um, and we were very excited for our partners at MLB to join on board with us and really be able to expand the program. And in fact, by the end of this school year, we will have impacted over 188,000 students um, across the country, which we're really, really proud of. I just want to give a quick thank you to Nobuli for putting this on today. Um, also, our esteemed panelists and um, our incredible, incredible partners at Major League Baseball. But most of all, I want to thank all of you and your commitment to helping stop bullying. Really, really, from the bottom of our hearts at ESPN and X Games, thank you. Um, so now I want to turn it uh, back to Nathan. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so at this time, I'm excited to introduce the founder of Nobuli, Nicholas Carlisle. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you so much, all of you, for giving up time in your busy schedule to join us today and for caring about this subject and caring about your, your students. This is an extraordinary time to be alive. The internet gives us the ability to connect with almost anyone across the world and to find information out on almost any subject. We're truly living in a digital age and that's the age in which we are raising our students. Nearly every young kid now has access to a digital device. We at No Bully are putting out a survey at the end of the month. And what that survey will show is that 84% of kids under the age of eight, 84% of kids under the age of eight have their own device that connects them to the internet. Those percentages only get bigger as students get older. So the old age of a digital divide is pretty much over for the United States. Nearly every kid you are, you are teaching has a device of their own. I wanted to give you that framework because it paints the broader picture of the internet, which is so easily seen as a force for darkness, but it's as much a force for darkness as for light. And I want us to be very clear about this too. It's not the internet that creates this dark subject of cyberbullying that we're talking about today. It's human nature. And just as bullying took place in all the areas where students were congregating in the era before the internet, it now takes place also in the internet. So the organizers for today's workshop wanted me to give you a, a definition of what cyberbullying is. So it's up on the screen right now. And it's a, it's a cluster definition, meaning that it's the whole range of different behaviors. As so you look at this, you'll see that what cyberbullying does is essentially takes a lot of what I call old style bullying, which is physical, verbal, relational bullying, and brings that across to the internet. There's also a, an important definitional point here. I don't want you, as you look at this, to think that cyberbullying is a standalone form of bullying. The reality is that nearly all the kids that are the target of cyberbullying are also the target of old style bullying in the school day. Often it starts online and moves back to the school yard or vice versa, but it's generally the same kids who are being targeted. So what that means for you as a school is that if you hear a report of cyberbullying, go wide, explore with your students what else is happening and how are they being treated by students at your school. Can we move to the next slide? And I'm going to talk now about where cyberbullying takes place. So uh, what we see here is, is uh, the, kind of the, the frequency of, of cyberbullying. There are lots of different types of cyberbullying. Girls are more likely to be bullied than, than boys. Um, and the reason for that is that there's a much more of a tendency of girls to use social media it's more likely to occur between friends and strangers because 
what we're talking about is the, generally the cohorts that are going through um, your schools together. And sadly, there's a lot of focus on, on differences. Moving to the next slide. What we see here is um, not surprisingly, uh, cyberbullying takes place in the websites that your tweens and teens most frequently uh, use. So we see here in order Instagram, which has become the site of choice for most, most teens and tweens, is the most prevalent site that online bullying takes place. And so you, see, you can see the list there and kind of order of, of frequency. Can we move to the next slide? The, the challenge with bullying generally, and it's also true of cyberbullying, is that it focuses on differences. So we did a survey in, um, which we're publishing with AT&T, which will appear in just a few weeks time. I think this is the same slide, maybe it's not. Um, and, and, and what that unveiled was the, the frequency that differences are the cause of cyberbullying. And interestingly, so much is focused on physical appearance, how you look, and then we have differences that are more classic differences of diversity like race and sexual orientation and, and disability. So as you tackle bullying and online bullying, because you're probably gonna be tackling both at the same time, there's a strong social justice element in what you are addressing. And that element is really against the fabric of what you're trying to do as a school. It's against the social justice aspect of the public education mandates that you are all championing in your schools. There's a particular challenge around online bullying. So yes, it is a type of bullying, but it's particularly invidious. And it's invidious in, in three ways. When a person goes online and they can't see the whites of your eyes, their empathy generally starts to fade, often to zero. And they do things online that they would not do in face-to-face -face interactions because those face-to-face -face interactions and your responses act somewhat as a break upon their behavior. And then once bullying has gone to the internet, it becomes its own reality TV show and is often treated as a form of entertainment which is then rapidly spread. And once it's gone viral, that post is very hard to remove. So we are facing a challenging phenomenon here. And the question that we're facing today is what can schools do to prevent bullying and cyberbullying? And I'm so glad that you've all joined us here today, us and all, these, uh, all the panelists that you see in front of you. And our mission at No Bully is to partner with schools for a year. And what we do in, in that year is we train schools in a system, it's called the No Bully system. And the point of that system is to uh, bring schools to a point where they can both prevent, prevent bullying and respond effectively when bullying takes place. And the way that we do that is we, we tap into the empathy of kids. 98% of kids do have empathy. And if you can create the conditions in your schools that promote that empathy, you have the strongest chance of turning bullying behaviors around. And I think what unites all the panelists today is our commitment to raising that empathy in students and bringing that forth as a solution to bullying. So that said, I'm gonna hand this back to, to Nathan and uh, enjoy this wonderful array of panelists that you have with us today. Great. Thank you very much, Nicholas. I think that was a very um, helpful overview, and I think we'll be able to ground the rest of, of the webinar in the context of that overview of what cyberbullying is, what it looks like, how it differs from other forms of bullying. Um, so at this time, I'm happy to be able to introduce our esteemed panelists. We have uh, three key panelists with us today, which you can see uh, their photos in the slide. Uh, first, we have Dr. Ed Green. Second, we have Janelle Maines. And finally, we have Alex Holmes. 
Uh, they have incredible uh, experience, qualifications, um, professional you know, backgrounds that uh, really make them uniquely suited uh, to talk to this issue in a variety of ways. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to ask each one of them to briefly introduce uh, themselves and provide a little bit of their bio when it's their turn to speak, rather than giving the full rundown of each of, each of their bios up front. Um, so with that being said, our first panelist today is Dr. Ed Green. Uh, Ed, can you briefly describe your work around this issue of cyberbullying for our uh, participants today? Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Ed Green. I'm Vice President for Children, Youth, and Digital Media Literacy Initiatives at the Hispanic Information and Telecommunications Network. And this is a 24-hour Spanish language, non-commercial, independent media uh, outlet. And uh, at, at, in my role there, uh, I work in the division called HIT and Learning. But overall, HITN's mission is really focused on a commitment to advance the educational and social economic aspirations of U.S. Hispanics through the development and distribution of quality uh, and authentic content, which is on air, online, and on the ground. And this also includes uh, opportunities for HITN to be involved in outreach initiatives such as the unique partnership that led to our work with the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office and its Bureau of Youth Initiatives and Diversion, and opportunities to talk about these issues related to cyberbullying. Uh, as background, uh, we are involved in work that really helps to give voice to, to young people through teaching storytelling skills, through both uh, technical film making and narrative skills. Uh, using 21st century skills uh, for students to learn to work in, in teams and collaborate and to provide adults, whether they're working in classrooms or in community-based organizations, with ways of uh, dealing with the accountability that they uh, need to deal with in terms of uh, looking at standards and things that they want uh, students to know and be able to do. But finally, we, we are using an approach that has student produced short form videos. And these are about uh, cyberbullying. The HITN uh, Digital Storytelling Workshop, which um, I'm a part of along with other members of our uh, teams at HITN and, and the DA's office, grew out of concerns and cases that are being seen in the Brooklyn District Attorney's Bureau of Youth Initiatives and Diversion. And it's really about the escalating cycle of retaliation violence and bullying that moves between the virtual world and the physical world. And so the digital social uh, uh, storytelling workshop was piloted with middle school and high school age students um, with initial students from Brooklyn International High School and Brooklyn's Police Athletic League after school initiative. And one of the things that we discovered is that it has to be acknowledged that youth themselves have voices that must be tapped and included and heard. And so what we've learned is that uh, students have background knowledge that we need to build upon. And so those are some of the elements that we've brought into this unique partnership between a media company, a software developer that deals with a smartphone app and with the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office. Great, thank you. So I think now maybe we can just dive right into concrete strategies uh, that will help the participants address the issue of cyberbullying. Um, so, you know, based on the experience that you've um, had with this initiative that you're talking about, what do you think are some concrete strategies uh, that teachers, youth leaders, anybody else on the line um, can use to really support the inclusion of student voice, specifically with regard to combating cyberbullying? Well, I think one of the things that we've learned and <clears throat> Um, our CEO, Mike Nieves, has really supported this work and seen how we can get at the untapped stories, including the stories of the inappropriate use of social media. So I think one of the examples that we can talk about in terms of a strategy is, is based on just an overall theory of change model that we use, and that is 
for those who are either working in, in, in direct uh, classroom uh, activities with youth or in our um, organizations, we, we have to have a mindset that says that teaching and learning that supports the inclusion of student voice um, has to have some strategies that actually get the student voice involved. So we believe that many people are familiar with project-based learning and some of the topics that are associated with cyber uh, bullying and cyber safety are topics that we encourage conversation uh, around and we, we want to be able to, to begin to use discussion starters that are around uh, that, that deal with those particular kinds of issues and have the students draw on their, um, their current knowledge and perceptions. Many young people have background knowledge about some of the issues that we talk about around cyberbullying, but unfortunately we don't, we don't always make sure that we're getting the input from them about their understandings of some of the facts and things that impact their lives. Mm -hmm. So a strategy, for example, of using principles of pedagogy that draw upon students' prior knowledge and the use of the English language arts standards, for example, that support the development of skills such as capturing factual information, demonstrating the ability to communicate and in include different uh, um, tools like digital uh, video are options that, that can easily be used. So one of the more general strategies is to use some of the things that we know about, about pedagogy and instruction to actually get student voice involved in bringing that information to the table. Hmm. So in terms of, you spoke to kind of the collaborative uh, element of working with students. And in thinking of students, what would you say are some ways that we can help students themselves learn how to protect themselves from um, becoming targets of cyberbullying online? In the conversations that, that we um, have uh, built into the process of the small group work that we do along with, uh, you know, the broader large group uh, work that we do, I think the notion of digital citizenship is a strategy that can be used to help young people think about how their behavior uh, is influencing others. And it's sort of like using the golden rule of online. Uh, it's really important to be able to talk about the ways that we treat others uh, is important to, to, to think about. But also uh, teaching them about the ways in which they use their information or they make their information available. Many young people um, are, are, are oftentimes just sort of ranting and so they'll tell things that don't need to be told necessarily online and, and forget that those things are going to stay with them because they don't go away. So I think, you know, just sort of one of the things that I think we try to do is to keep the conversation open in terms of understanding how your behavior impacts others, but how your behavior as an upstander uh, might be able to help uh, eliminate some of the things that are more negative that you encounter online. So having a proactive approach in that direction mm -hmm. also represents some of the things in our uh, workshop. That's great. Uh, thank you for sharing both of those, well, several strategies. Um, and again, like we mentioned, we want to recap each panelist's recommendations um, so that, you know, you don't have to frantically take notes. So at this time, we're going to bring up uh, a slide which kind of distills the three key recommendations that Ed just shared. Um, so I'm just going to read through this. And again, this will be emailed to you. So number one, allow students to tell their stories using a simple video capturing app, such as DIY Doc. Number two, always build on the student's prior knowledge of how cyberbullying affects their lives. And then finally, number three, use project-based learning to have students problem solve around the use of social media. These are fantastic. So moving on, we're actually going to uh, introduce someone uh, that is working in schools uh, right now as uh, I believe as a teacher. I'm sorry if, I, if I'm getting that wrong. Um, Janelle, I'm going to ask you to briefly describe your work around the issue of cyberbullying. Sure. So uh, my name is Janelle Manis. I'm actually an assistant principal this year at a middle school here in um, Pueblo, Colorado. This is my first year as an administrator. Um, previous to this position, I worked as an RTI coach in the same building. 
um, and I oversaw our no bully program here at Ron Colley. Um, so That's the cool. last three years I've worked with no bully um, and this year I'm doing it in the administrative uh, aspect, but previously I would work with our solution team, solution coaches, um, and help oversee bullying issues within our building. Mm. So you, you've seen solution coaching from a variety of different perspectives, in other words, mm -hmm. it sounds like. Well, for those that don't know, uh, solution coaching is No Bully's kind of premier uh, flagship program in terms of addressing bullying in schools. Um, so because I'm imagining many people probably aren't familiar with it, uh, Janelle, if you could just brief briefly describe of I'm sorry, briefly describe the process of what it entails. Sure. So um, we actually reached out to No Bully looking for a solution for bullying. Um, we know middle school is tough. Um, some will argue that that's the hardest time in people's lives. And so we knew that we had an issue with bullying and we needed support for that. Um, no Bully offers a solution team process along with many other aspects. But that process um, is basically training teachers on how to empower students to solve these real life problems. Um, instead of administrators handing out consequences and students just getting disciplined and retaliating or turning that around and, and not learning anything from it, um, the solution team process and solution coaching process allowed us to train our teachers. Um, our teachers attended a full day training we also had our counselors and administrators go, but um, they attended a full day training. And during that time, they learned how to run solution teams. And those teams are built up of students who are involved in the um, bullying problem, whether as a bully, um, a bully follower, or they could just be positive peers who have contact with the student who is the target. And those teams come together to really look at the problem at hand um, and see what they can do to help solve that for that student. And um, then, you know, a lot of times it ends up carrying on with where they want to begin solving problems that they've seen with other students or other forms of bullying happening. Hmm. Maybe we can dig down kind of even, even deeper and get more granular in terms of how it works uh, practically. So um, if you could walk us through a recent incident uh, and describe how a staff member who's trained in solution coach training, um, how did they respond to this incident? If you could walk us through that. Sure. So um, we look at all bullying as bullying. Um, we do have cyber bullying. We do have physical, relational, verbal bullying that happens. And we want to take every um, bullying situation seriously. And what I've heard from some people is cyber bullying isn't happening at school. The kids don't have their phones. It's not a school issue. Um, for me, what I've seen is the kids carry that on with them into school. So it is, it is a school issue. Um, they're not able to perform at school in a way that they should be because they have other things on their mind that are distracting them. So when we have a bullying concern brought to our attention, um, teachers, students, parents, administrators, the custodian, anyone can notice this and refer a student to the no bully process. Um, at that time, we look at the concern and we look and see if it is bullying, if it's something that's repeated, if it's something that was posted online. Um, and we look at it, how we can solve that and who would be the best person to use for that problem. Um, at that point, the student will meet with a solution team coach and really give their side of the story and what's happening. And that's kind of their go-to throughout the process. And that solution team coach notifies parents um, and talks with them, informs them of the process that will be used, and then they begin to put together a solution team. Those teams usually start up with six to eight people. Um, a recent experience that we've had, a student had um, just, she, she was new to, to our building and had something posted online about, you know, why did she come here? Um, not even a name, but why is she here? Um, and just kids kind of, yeah, I don't know where she came from and, you know, what she's doing at our school. And so it was brought to our attention and the solution coach got a group together. Um, the person who posted the initial post, um, who really in this situation was the bully, along with some bully followers who were commenting or sharing the post. Um, and then some students who were just positive peers in our building. And they have three meetings. So the first meeting, the target is not involved in. Um, but the targets already met with the solution coach and at that they just 
the solution team leader really pushed out the concern. And hey, you remember when you were new to a building or you were new somewhere or when you came in as sixth graders and tries to put the students in that target's shoes um, and tries to really tie into the empathy factor that all students have. We know that they all have empathy. Um, and just walk them through. This student, was, you know, this was posted about her and now she's really not feeling like she belongs here. She's really scared to come to school. Um, she, she's saying that she's sick and going home early. And, you know, that's, that's not okay. We want everyone at our school to be successful and be a part of our pack. And so, you know, how can we support this student? And it's, it was amazing. The students involved, even the bully who initially posted it, right away stepped up. Oh, well, I'll greet her, I'll say hi, you know, I'll walk her to class. Um, and they, they just started brainstorming different projects. You know, I noticed that she sits alone at lunch. I'm gonna go sit with her at lunch. And then throughout the week, we were able to see students actually moving from their normal table at lunch and going and sitting with a student. Um, students walking her to class and saying hi and asking how she was doing. Um, and then we follow up with that. We meet for three weeks. And that third week, we allow the target to join the meeting if they choose. Um, and so, so far when we've done this, we've, really, we've been 100% successful in lowering the frequency of the bullying um, or eliminating the bullying altogether. So um, this one in particular, it was just so neat to see this new student who was really rejected um, all of a sudden becoming part of the group and having friends and people to talk to and sit with. And, um, and the bully was really able to learn a lesson from it instead of just saying, oh, you know, here's, the, here's your consequences, don't do it again. They were really able to turn it around and fix the problem, um, which really gets the power back to the students and works on those real life problem solving skills. Awesome. So, you know, obviously I work for No Bully, so it's not the first time I've, I've heard this. Um, and yet every time I hear an administrator or, or a teacher talk about solution coach training, it's, it's such a simple solution and yet it's so radical in the climate that we're in right now. It's, it's um, you know, having, developing students' empathy uh, is really a radically effective solution. And it's, it's just really encouraging to hear um, from people on the front lines about you know, how it works in practice. Um, so, you know, beyond students, beyond teachers, administrators, parents are also deeply affected uh, when their child is either bullying other children or kind of being on the receiving end of bullying. So in your experience as an administrator, what tips do you have for parents? Um, you know, how can they help their kids when they're the target of cyberbullying? Sure. Um, I think it's hard, you know, like you said, it's hard for them to see their students going through it on either end. Um, and so the first thing that we need to do is really look at working with the families and making sure that it's not a, you know, they're doing this, they're getting consequences and, and we're moving forward, but what can we do to fix that? And um, allowing parents to be educated on the process and, uh, you know, making sure that they know it's okay for them to monitor social media it's okay for them to be friends with their students on social media. Um, it's okay for them to talk to students and report issues to school. So often they try to solve it on their own um, or they say, oh, well, if someone's doing that, I'm gonna go and do this. And they, they just make the issue worse because they end up um, really bullying the person who was bullying their student um, or bullying the parents of the person who was bullying their student. And so, um, you know, just teaching them the skills that we're using as far as, you know, this is a problem, it's not okay. We're not accepting it, but we are going to monitor. We are gonna look at solutions. We are gonna move forward and we need your support through that and for you to have an open mind throughout the process. Um, but really, really making sure that families do partner with their students and partner with the school and um, that communication is really important. So students aren't afraid to report issues and um, parents aren't afraid to report issues and that they're seeing things right away instead of finding out a few months later um, that this has been happening and no one knew. Yeah, that's great. Thank you again for sharing. Um, right. We're actually going to recap your recommendations. Lynn, if you can pull those up on the screen. Uh, if anybody has just joined recently, um, just so you know, you'll be receiving these slides after today's webinar, so no need to write everything down. Um, so again, uh, Janelle's recommendations for parents specifically. Uh, number one, monitor your child's social media accounts. Know who they're friends with, what they're posting, and who's posting about them or tagging them. Number two, 
share suspicious information with your child's school because they want to know and they want to help. And number three, uh, be a positive example for your child. If they see you posting mean comments, even to celebrities or people they don't know, they tend to think that those comments are okay for them to make as well. So really um, living through example. So now actually from Colorado, we're going to go all the way across the Atlantic. Well, uh, in spirit, yes, but I think Alex is actually in San Diego, so we're not going that far. Um, but anyways, let's hear from Alex's international experience around our topic of cyberbullying. Hi, yeah, great, great to be with you. I'm usually in uh, the United Kingdom, but today uh, I'm in San Diego because next week is the International Bullying Prevention Associations Conference uh, in, in San Diego. So it's good to be here. A little bit warmer than London than when I left was snowing, believe it or not. Um, so my name's Alex. I work for, for a non-profit called the Diana Award, which is in memory of Princess Diana. It's based on the belief that young people have the power to change the world. And all of our programs are very much about giving young people those skills and the motivation and hopefully the knowledge to make a real difference, particularly when it comes to bullying and, and shaping attitudes and changing behaviors. Uh, and um, we've been really lucky to, to, to do quite a bit of work within the UK, Ireland, and Europe, and also most recently Miami high schools, where we've introduced the program called Anti-Bullying Ambassadors, which are young people whose job it is to keep not only themselves safe online uh, and offline, but also their peers. And it's all about giving them that, that positive motivation and the knowledge and the skills so that they feel like they can make a real difference when it comes to educating their peers. Mm. It seems like a, a common theme that I'm hearing from all of our panelists today is, is student voice and the empowerment of young people in the process of addressing cyberbullying. In terms of strategies, um, what approaches have you found in your work to be most effective in addressing cyberbullying? Hmm. Uh, well, my, my own work is, is, uh, has been influenced by my own experience of school. Uh, which which had bullying. Unfortunately, it wasn't um, cyberbullying, partly because technology wasn't as developed that day, those days. Uh, and um, I think the biggest thing was MySpace, which is why my mom still gets confused and calls Facebook MyFace. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that's a challenge there in itself. But um, for me, I could go home and, and the bedroom didn't follow me. Uh, sorry, go home to, to the bedroom and, and the bullying didn't follow me uh, to, to the bedroom. Um, but what was missing really was, was peers standing up for me. Uh, I found that when I was at school, a huge amount of time as a child you, you spend at school. We worked out 11,000 hours of your life you, you spend at school. Uh, and I found that a lot of those times when I was made to feel upset and safe or uncomfortable, there weren't peers that were standing up for me. So I, I think involving young people in some of the decision making and really allowing them to, to develop the approaches and the strategies are, is so important. And I think where a lot of schools go wrong is they, they don't necessarily uh, involve young people in writing their policy or their prevention work. And that's really important that you do that from the outset and that you survey young people in the school population to find out what the climate is like, what are some of the issues, because that makes your approach as, as a teacher much stronger than perhaps having to guess at what you think might make a difference. Hearing directly from young people and involving them in that process and taking them on the journey so that actually you can see uh, what together what you've implemented and the difference you've made is really really important so that's why uh, at the charity we, we really believe in, in the power of peer uh, young people who we call anti-bullying ambassadors who can make a real real difference and when you together as a, as a member of staff school staff and, and and your young team think about some of the issues learn about some of the issues together that's when you can see a, a lot of change and, and we found that it's very simple things like utilizing uh, the time that there is perhaps for registration in the mornings or if there's particular sessions, lunch times, after school, that is when young people in particular with their staff can lead on putting on some of these sessions, presenting assemblies, uh, talking about uh, reporting, blocking, safety on certain platforms and doing that together as, as a team of young people and school staff 
makes a real difference because I think often, um, you know, I think it's just the same for me now. It's not as powerful me going into a school than, than it is the students themselves going in, presenting the information. I think because the students don't have that authority tone, uh, you know, and they, they, they're not a, perhaps you know, a teacher or a parent or an adult, and therefore they can speak on the same level. So I, I think really believe in young people and with them learn about the technology that young people are using because it's a safe space between both of you uh, and, and, and allow you, those young people to present some of the facts to their peers because that will shape attitudes and, and change behaviours. Mm. So in addition to empowering and including young people in the process, are there any other best practices that you can recommend for educators to really address and stop cyberbullying? Yeah, I think, um, you know, educators, you have a, have a really difficult task. You know, I've, I've even seen one of the questions that's come in so far, uh, which is talking about how they've got the, the no bully system in, in the school and it's working really well. Um, but the difficulty is around cyberbullying and, and, and that technology disappearing, uh, which is, you know, a real challenge. I think as educators, you can do your best to, to learn as much as you can about the platforms. One of the things that young people often tell us is that, when they report cyberbullying to their school staff. Um, I think partly because the school staff don't have that confidence, they can sometimes feel like that, that it isn't taken seriously. And I can understand that because as school staff, if you don't know how a platform works or you don't know how to solve it because you know, the evidence has, has disappeared, that's really, really difficult. But what you can do as, as members of staff in that school is make sure you have a general bit of awareness of, of some of the major platforms that your, your children are using. And Nicholas shared some great examples there of what the top uh, platforms, and there's new ones all the time, so you're never going to quite uh, learn all of them. But if you know a bit about how reporting works on Facebook, on Snapchat, uh, you know, how you can take a screenshot, how you can mute people, block people, then that's, that's really, really useful to do. So I think that's, that's one thing, learn about the technology. But the other thing comes down to your response, you know, where people where young people have really lost some, some confidence and some trust in uh, the, the process and, and, and the reporting uh, is when they've come to a teacher and the, and the teacher hasn't done the following. And we always recommend listening, praising them for speaking out because, you know, that's taken a lot, lot of confidence and they've been really brave to do that. Um, not taking over the problem. I think one of the, the difficulties is often that uh, as adults, we like to try and take over everything and we say, thank you so much for telling us, uh, Alex. No, we, no, you go back to lesson and we're going to sort this out. And that is a horrible feeling for a child because you're thinking, what's the teacher going to do? Are they going to make it 10 times worse? So ask them what, what they would like to be done about the situation. What can we do together to solve this? I think that's really important to give them some of that confidence and that ownership of, of, the, of the problem because when you're being bullied, that power is taken away from you. So I, I think that, that that's really, really important. And I, I think just going back, you know, one of the, the most powerful things you can do is, is train up your young people to be those uh, ambassadors, those leaders who can shape some of the ideas because they will come up with things that make it far more exciting than we can. You know, things around drama on cyberbullying and responses, uh, thinking about some top tips information about how to be resilient online. Because what we've got to also understand is that unkindness and, and sometimes you know, bullying will happen online. What we need to be able to do as, as young people is, is really be able to respond to that effectively. So they might have some really, really good top tips. Uh, and, and also if they're able to go into their, their peers' workshops classrooms and and, you know, and lead on some of these sessions then that would be really really valuable so i would definitely think about you know who are your leaders that could make a real difference in the school on this mm. so building on what you just shared um how do you think what are some strategies we can use to help students use their voices to have the courage to report cyberbullying mm. um, whether it's they themselves that are being bullied or maybe they've witnessed their friend being bullied Oftentimes, we don't have more bystanders because young people are afraid of being labeled a snitch or afraid of uh, retaliation. So in your you know, work, what, what are some ways that you think we can empower young people to speak up in that way? I think that's a really, really good question. And often uh, when we train schools and young people, the first thing they say they're going to do is some sort of reporting 
post box or reporting email address. And, and that is great, but I think what that misses is the fact that you have to, as you just pointed out, do a lot of work initially to change the culture, to encourage people to speak out, to, to encourage people to trust the system that you're putting in place. So I think be a little bit more uh, thoughtful about you, your approach because you can't expect suddenly, just because you've talked about bullying, for everyone to come forward and feel confident with reporting that. So I think it is about First of all, setting that very clear standard, that message that bullying isn't tolerated, building on some of the activities that might provide students with a safe space to speak out about that. And that's often in, in, in the real world, physical space. It could be a lunch club. It could be a drop-in session that's um, supported and run by your student team. Uh, think about how do you create those opportunities, those safe spaces, those times in uh, the school day where perhaps uh, a teacher or a leader um, can really talk to a class about bullying and, and, and really go through the policy. But I think um, what you need to do is, is, is really um, consider what is the best, the best approach. I've found that um, speaking to young people about how do you change that culture of, of speaking out is, is vital. In, in, in the UK in particular, and, and we've found that, that the idea that you are snitching on someone really does hold a lot of young people back from reporting. Some of the best approaches to changing that have been where students have led on a campaign. And uh, one of my favorites, which is spread in lots of schools in Ireland that we've worked with, is called reporting is supporting. So it's this idea that actually you want your school community to report because when someone reports something that they don't feel confident or happy or safe about, then that supports the whole of the community. And they came up with a great campaign, banners, uh, a slogan, there was a rap about it. Uh, and I think it's about sending that very clear message, when it, particularly when it comes from young people and influential young people and leaders, that actually we want people to feel that they can report and they can support each other. And I think giving practical examples of actually, you know, I'm a teacher. If you came to me to, to report, this is how I would treat it. This is how I deal with it sensitively. I think that is so important because there's often just a lack of trust or that nervousness about speaking to one of those adults because they might not treat it sensitively. So I think you have to be you know, real role models that you are and, and actually demonstrate that uh, to, to young people about how you would treat a report seriously and what you would do. Uh, and then you can start to think about once you've done demonstrated that and, and thought about campaigns, what are the mechanisms to report? So is it about introducing an anonymous email address? Is it about a, a post box, a sort of physical post box where they can uh, post uh, the, their reports? Uh, or is it about regular discussions in, in the school calendar, in the school day, where you can highlight bullying, you can encourage people to speak out? Those would be some of my first sort of uh, approaches to think about, I think. Those are great. Thanks for sharing those. Um, we're actually going to recap your recommendations right now. So Lynn, if you can pull up uh, the slide for the recap. So here we have Alex's top three, actually four recommendations. Uh, number one, use anti-bullying ambassadors at each school to prevent bullying. Number two, the power of peers can be used to encourage students to be upstanders. Number three, use the 11,000 hours that students spend in school to engage them with messaging around online safety. And number four, utilize anonymous reporting apps. These are all great. So actually, thank you to all of our panelists. We've reached uh, the Q&A session. Uh, it looks like we have two questions, so I think we'll be able to get through both of them. Uh, the first question seems to be, this may be something that Dr. Green can speak to, the question is, what is the DIY doc and how does it work? I think Dr. Green is muted. Then if you can. Unmute. I am now off mute. There you go. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, one of the things, and if people want additional information, um, 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 uh, they can go to hitn.org. But the DIY doc is a, uh, an app that actually has been developed for the smartphone and the creators were doing it to help democratize filmmaking. In other words, it's a way to be able to capture the essence of a message you want to be able to deliver. 
and it does it through a templated approach that helps walk you through so that you can create a one and a half to two minute message. And it's done in a way that allows you to really have that uh, message created without having to have editing equipment, what have you. When you finish each of the five or six templates that walk you through what you want a message, which starts with, you know, who are you? What is it that you're trying to say? What's some background information? What's your call to action? Those segments go up to the cloud and come back as a finished video. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a tool that we're using right now at HITN to help capture the voices of uh, young people who are talking about issues that they can share with their peers and with others. Um, if, all, if you also want to get some background information, you can go to DIYDOC.TV. That's great. Thank you. Uh, this second question, I think whoever feels comfortable addressing it, feel free to. Um, the question is, well, it begins saying, we are, a, this is from Francine, we are a no bully school and it works. How do you address accusations of cyberbullying on Snapchat? There is no quote proof. And I think the reason why that is, is videos disappear after they're uploaded, correct me if I'm wrong. I think Alex spoke to this a little bit, um, but if any, if any of our panelists have ideas about how to address accusations of cyberbullying that takes place on Snapchat specifically, I can kind of speak a little bit to that as an administrator and a solution team coach because I think that they're two totally different reactions. Sure, please do. As an administrator, if I'm going to give consequences for a behavior, then I do need to have enough evidence that that's actually happened to give a consequence. Um, so if there's no proof, then it's really hard for me to justify you know, giving any sort of consequence. However, um, if someone is struggling because something that was said or done, I don't necessarily have to have proof for that. I can say that, hey, this kid is really having a tough time and this is why. And I'm not, um, I'm, I'm addressing the situation with the bully as a solution team coach, but I'm not saying that this person said this. So um, in that aspect, I'm not, I don't need proof. Um, I can just say, hey, somebody posted this post on Snapchat um, and this student is really, really having a tough time because of the way it made them feel and walk everyone in the team through that process um, without specifically calling out a, an individual student for posting or not posting. Um, so I can still address the issue and the concern and give that target support um, without having hard evidence or proof that that post was even ever created. Mm. Great. Thank you, Janelle. Uh, we have a third question. I'd like to direct this to Nicholas. Nicholas, if you can uh, unmute yourself. Uh, this is from Patricia. She writes, I work in public health for a small state and have been trying to get nobly instituted in our public schools with, with not much luck. We have it in four schools, but there are over 300 schools. Do you have any tips I could use as a quote sales pitch when selling this to our Department of Education? Um, well, the, the short answer is Patricia reach out to us. We, we, we can talk to you about how to do this, but it, it actually costs your, your schools a lot of money um, to have bullying going on. Students are out of school because of, of bullying, they're missing days at school. And then the risks that you're exposed to are large. I'm, I'm often an expert witness in, in cyberbullying cases, which have gone, bullying cases have gone horribly wrong and students have either um, fallen very ill or sadly killed themselves. And the costs of those are enormous. So there's a pretty strong case you can make to your, your school district or your state to say, guys, this is actually gonna save us money if we, if we do this. Mm. That's great, thank you. Um, now, I'm looking through the questions. I heard there was a follow-up question for Dr. Green. I'm not seeing it. Um, we'll move on to the next question. Lynn, if you see that question, please type it to me via text, the one that you were mentioning. Um, the separate question, I think that we can open this to all panelists. This comes from Roberto. The question is, how do we get students to gain more confidence to report that they are bullied? Would anybody like to address this? You're, you're all on. I'll, I'll, 
diving, diving very quickly on that. So, so um, the big challenge that Alex named too is, 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 is the fear of being a snitch. And uh, the reason that students are not wanting to be seen as the one that reports is they don't want to get other students into trouble and uh, have the school's authorities cascading punishment down upon them because they know it leads to retaliation. So the way that uh, you get around that is to build trust in students that you can actually take a solution-focused approach to the problem that doesn't end up in, in punishment, but actually ends up in students being brought into the solution. So I think all of us in our various ways are suggesting non-punitive uh, um, solutions. Um, certainly solution team and no bully does that. And I want to give a, just a kind of concrete example here. I was brought into a, a case in, in California. The student had uh, been filmed uh, on, in the stalls in his school in a, in a compromising activity. That video was posted online. He was so humiliated that one week later they found him dead. That school, which is the high school, proudly said that um, it had no cyberbullying problem because only one case of cyberbullying had been reported that year. We went into the surveys on that school. Every school here in, in California and in most states is to do a student wellness survey, student health survey. And we found that in that high school, 200 school students every year were um, experiencing cyberbullying. One, only one was reporting it. So the, the question then came, what was going on here? And the answer as we investigated further was that the school had gone in really hard and threatened uh, to bring the police in on any students who was involved in, in cyberbullying. They had the best intentions there, but the problem was that escalated the, the, the fear of being seen as a snitch because the police were gonna get involved. So the, 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 the moral of the tale is, um, although you may think that th all sorts of threats are actually gonna help their, your students, they're not. Go in instead with the much more solution focus approach, we can solve this together, and you're much more likely to get students to come forward and report. Mm, that's great. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, due to time, uh, we're going to wrap up our Q&A session now. Uh, but before we conclude the webinar, I'd like to turn it over to Billy Bean, the Vice President and Special Assistant to the Commissioner of Major League Baseball. Thank you, Billy. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, we just want to, uh, first of all, my name is Billy Bean, I'm Vice President, Special Assistant to the Commissioner, and uh, alongside uh, Melanie and LeBron, my colleague here at MLB and the rest of our team, uh, we want to thank everyone for uh, the time and effort to participate today. Um, our partnership with ESPN on Shred Hate is, uh, represents the first ever uh, official league-led bullying prevention program for Major League Baseball. Um, we believe so strongly in the curriculum um, because it aligns uh, with uh, many of our character-driven education efforts in our Breaking Barriers program, our RBI program, and our youth academies. Um, and also uh, a wonderful extension of the anti-discrimination and uh, I mean, anti-harassment, non-discrimination policies that we apply to our clubhouses, our front offices, and our ballparks. But uh, over the past year of the program, we have seen firsthand um, and been inspired by the students who have been felt safe enough to share uh, some of their past experiences and use those as learning experiences for the rest, and also the commitment that they have shown in our first year schools to create and sustain a, a bully free zone. And um, our commitment to grow the program uh, and continue to serve our communities excites us. Uh, we appreciate the commitment that everyone uh, who's on board today uh, has made. Um, the three contributors today, wonderful resources that we can utilize as we move forward, and we're very uh, appreciative of that. Um, we look forward to, like I said, growing the program. We have uh, some really exciting things to share in the coming year. We have a whole slow, a slew of all-star players who participated after seeing uh, the work we were doing in support of the program and we really are excited that uh, we can uh, elevate uh, its impact uh, in the coming year. So thank you so much on behalf of Major League Baseball. We look forward to working together uh, very much. Thank you very much, Billy. And I would just like to echo uh, what Billy shared. We really appreciate everybody taking the time to join us today, our panelists, our participants, 
extra special thanks to our sponsors, ESPN, Major League Baseball, X Games. We hope that you found today valuable. Uh, we hope that you can take strategies away uh, from this webinar. We will be emailing out the link so that you can watch this again along with the slideshow. Uh, let's continue the dialogue and let's continue to work uh, to really protect students and to eliminate, eliminate bullying from the face of the earth. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great day.